In this lecture, we will study the frequency dependence of the gain of the CE amplifier circuit. To study the gain, what we need to do once again is to consider the Vs alone, that is set Vcc to 0, hence R1 comes in parallel to R2, Rc gets connected between collector and the ground and so on. But of course, since we are trying to talk about the effect of CB1, CB2 and CE at the low frequency end of the spectrum, uh, we will not replace them by shorts, we will retain them in the circuit. And so, the effective small signal circuit that we will get, this is an effective small signal circuit, but not in the mid band range, but in the low frequency range, is as follows. Note that we have R1 parallel R2 as before, RE, RC connected between collector and emitter, sorry, collector and ground, RL on the other side, but now RC and RL are actually no longer in parallel, there is CB2 between them, you have CB1, which is connected between the source and the circuit, and CB1 is no longer a short, and C also is not shorted out. So we will now have to talk about what this circuit will behave like. We will of course replace the transistor by its equivalent circuit and just to keep things simple, we are going to use the simpler version. Because we have already seen that it doesn't really make much difference whether we use the full H parameter model or the approximate H parameter or the Ebersmol inspired model. Okay, but even when you do that, and you replace the transistor by this part in red here, beta plus 1 RD, beta IB. Of course, when you come from the ever small side, you realize that this is beta plus 1 RD and this is beta IB. When you start from the H parameter equivalence, these are really nothing but HIE and HFE, where we have ignored HRD and HOE. But anyway, after I do all this, this is a circuit which, which we can now analyze using standard circuit analysis rules but despite that I would still say that this is a very complicated circuit with too many capacitors and as a result the frequency dependence will be way too complicated. So first of all we will simplify things a bit further. In most situations R1 parallel R2 we have already said that before R1 parallel R2 is of the order of tens of kilo ohms so it's much larger than beta plus 1 RE, which is of the order of a kilo ohm or so. So because it's much larger than this, you can simply ignore this connection. The current will hardly flow through this. Most of it will flow through this. So you can open this out. Also, unless your source is really bad, RS will be of the order of a few tens of ohms, so much smaller than beta plus 1 RE. And since RS is in series with beta plus 1 RE, being much smaller, you can also ignore it. So you can simplify this circuit a bit further and end up with this one. So I've just ignored the RS, opened up R1 parallel R2 and now the resistances you have in the circuit beta plus 1 RE, capital RE, RC, RL are all typically of the order of a kilo ohm or so. Of course they might differ in their value but they are of the same order so you can no longer ignore one in favor of the other. But we still have three capacitors and the circuit is way too complicated to really do reasonable calculations with. Of course, you can do the calculation. Calculation will not be that difficult. After all, we know the techniques for doing such calculations. We have actually calculated the results for more complicated circuits in the early days of this course. But it's not enough just to calculate the result, it's also important to interpret the results well and find out what they mean. And that is going to be difficult to do if you have all the capacitors in place. So what we will do is essentially we will divide and conquer. So what that means is something like this. We have three capacitors in the circuit, CB1, CB2 and CE. And the job of each of these three capacitors is to bring the gain down when you move to the low frequency end. That is, CB1 will bring the gain down because once the frequency is low enough, CB1 will have large impedance. So whatever the source voltage is, that full thing will not be delivered to the transistor. And of course, the transistor only amplifies what it gets. So if it does not get the full voltage, it will not 
amplify as much. CB2, well, at low frequency, CB2 will essentially produce an impedance here, which will mean that the output voltage, instead of going through RL, will only partially dr drop across RL, part of it will drop across CB2. So basically, it blocks the output voltage from going over entirely to the load. It really blocks the current, but the effect is it reduces the output voltage. CE's action is slightly more complicated. It will bring down the gain with low frequencies, but that's simply because it will now no longer bypass the emitter resistor, or more importantly, it will itself work like an impedance here, and that will provide negative feedback to the amplifier circuit. But the net effect is each of the three capacitors will try to bring the gain down when the frequency goes down. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, they will bring down the gain at different rates. And it might very well happen that at a frequency range in which CB1 already has worked to bring down the gain a lot, CE or CB2 has not kicked in yet. Or the gain has already come down due to CE a lot and the effect of CB1 and CB2 is really not that apparent yet. Of course, it might so happen that the values of CE, CB1 and CB2 are such that they have sort of if equal effect on bringing down the gain, then the situation is going to be much more complicated. But if it is feasible that one of them brings down the gain and at that frequency range at which one of them has already brought down the gain substantially, the other capacitors can still be treated as shorts, then life would be a lot easier. Now, how do you know whether that works? Well, one way it would be to just try it out. What you will do is take CB1, CE and CB2 in turn, that is take one of the capacitors, treat the other two as shorts, this is what I mean by divide and conquer, and calculate the frequency at which the gain will fall by a factor of root 2. I hope you all remember why 1 by root 2 is an important thing here. That is of course the 3 dB frequency, in this case the lower 3 dB frequency, this is the lower end of the frequency spectrum. So the lower 3 dB frequency for the amplifier can be estimated for CB1, CB2 and CE. And if it so happens, just to give an example, suppose CB1 tells you that the lower 3 dB frequency is 800 Hz. And CE and CB2 tell you that they are somewhere around 400 Hz. So that means that by the time the frequencies drop to 800 Hz, CB1 alone is good enough to bring the frequency down or the output down to a factor of 1 by root 2. And because the cutoff frequencies due to CE and CB2 are a lot lower than that, the effect of CE and CB2 are still not very prominent at 800 Hertz. So then 800 Hertz will be a reasonably good estimate for my cutoff frequency. So essentially the rule goes, find out the cutoff frequencies for each one of them individually. If the highest of the cutoff frequencies is separated a lot from the other two cutoff frequencies, then that is the cutoff frequency that you will estimate your circuit to have. Because at that frequency, due to one of the three capacitors, the gain has already come down to a factor of by a factor of one by root two, and the other capacitors are still not well, are still not really contributing to bringing down the gain a lot there. So we will do this in steps. I will just illustrate a couple of them. Let's say we take only CB1, that is, we are going to treat this effective circuit by replacing CE and CB2 as shorts. So CE is a short, that means RE and CE goes out. CB2 is a short, which means RC and RL come out in parallel. And now we want to calculate the voltage gain for this circuit. And the voltage gain for this circuit is really very easy to calculate because VO, as we have seen several times before, before is simply beta IB times this RL prime with a minus sign. That's what VO is. And what about IB, the input volt current? The input current is simply the source voltage Vs divided by the total impedance here, which is beta plus 1 RE 
plus 1 by j omega cb1. So, if you use this, you plug this ib back here and divide by vs, what you are going to get is the vo by vs ratio avs and that works out to be simply minus beta rl prime divided by this factor here, beta plus 1 re by 1 plus g, 1 by g omega cb1. Now, if cb1 is the only capacitor that is effective at this frequency range, then this is a reasonably good expression. But now notice that for large frequencies, what is going to happen is even G, cb1 will behave like a shot, even this impedance will go away. That is when we hit the mid-band frequency range. And at the mid-band frequency range, AVS is going to be given by AVS mid-band, which you can get from this expression simply by dropping this term, ignoring this because it is very small. And you do get minus beta RL prime by beta plus 1 small re, which if you remember is actually the gain that we had calculated earlier as well. Not quite because that was AV and not AVS. That was because there we still had to calculate the effect of small rs and the r1 parallel r2 but as you have argued those effects are very small so we have ignored them now now that we have this avs mid band expression what we can do is we can rewrite the avs expression just by writing this as avs mid band which is this whole factor times this or divided by this factor now from our experience with lower cutoff frequencies for filters, we know very well that AVS will fall by a factor of root 2 in magnitude. Of course, this is a complex number, so the imaginary part essentially tells you, or the phase part really tells you that there is a phase difference that happens between uh, AVS and AVS midband. AVS midband is negative, that actually means that the output is always out of phase with the input in the midband. But here, what we see is AVS actually has an additional phase shift because of this term. So, the output will not be exactly out of phase with the input, there will be, will be some other phase shift. But if you just look at the magnitude of this, that will tell you that AVS will fall off to 1 by root 2 times AVS mid band when this has magnitude 1. And that really tells you a very easy way to calculate the cutoff frequency for this CB1. So, this is not F, F half that much, this is F half just due to CB1, that is given by 1 by 2 pi CB1 into beta plus 1 RE. So, just a quick estimate, if CB1 say, less, of course that depends on the value of CB1, but CB1 say is of the order of 1 microfarad and HIE which is beta plus 1 RE is of the order of a kilo ohm, the product of the two is of the order of a millisecond. So, this comes out to be 1000 uh, hertz divided by 2 pi. So, 1000 by 6 roughly 166 hertz or something around 200 hertz or so. So, that would be the cutoff frequency estimated using CB1. Now that we have understood the effect that CB1 has on the gain of the common emitter amplifier at low frequencies, let us now take a look at the effect that CE, the emitter bypass capacitor will have. But before we do that, let me just try to explain why we expect CE to be in a way more effective than CB1 if it has a comparable size. Notice that the half power frequency for CB1 occurred essentially when the impedance offered by CB1 matched the impedance offered by the other resistor in the circuit, in this case beta plus 1 RD. That is how you found out the half power frequency. Now, if you consider the same, same situation, but this time with CE, notice the CE actually is going to get a lot more current flowing through it than CB1. Here, IB flows through CB1 and on the other hand, beta plus 1 times that current flows through the emitter. Of course, it gets branched between RE and CE, but uh, Unless the frequency is really very, very low, so that CE becomes a huge impedance, much, much bigger than RE, unless that happens, you would expect CE to get bulk of that current. 
since bulk of the current flows through the emitter capacitor, emitter bypass capacitor, much much more current than would flow through CB1, you do expect the effect of CE to be more pronounced. And that happens to be the case, as we will soon see. Uh, so we will now calculate the effect of CE and CE alone. So we are assuming a different scenario here. We are assuming that the, free, the gain gets cut down by a factor of 1 by root 2. That is, uh, you reach the upper cut of, sorry, the lower cut of frequency due to CE much, much before either CB1 or CB2 begin to show any appreciable impedance. That is, the frequency is still too high for CB1 and CB2 to have appreciable impedance, but CE already will have a large effect. So let us see how that will happen. Now we are going to make a simplifying assumption before we do the calculation. And that assumption is at the relevant frequency, the frequency at which on which we are focusing, basically the frequency at which the gain will fall off by a factor of root 2 from the mid-band frequency, the impedance of CE in this case or XCE, the reactance, is still very much lower than R. So, C, C is not zero impedance because the frequency is not that high. Now that the frequency has come below the mid-band frequency range, you expect the impedance of C E to go up. But let's just say, at least we are, for the sake of simplicity, we are making this assumption for the time being, that the cutoff frequency will be reached because of the effect of C E even when the impedance of CE is much, much smaller than RD. Uh, we will see later whether this is a justifiable approximation. But if it is, then of course we can replace the RD-CE parallel combination simply by CE alone because RD will have too big an impedance and as you know, in a parallel combination, if one impedance is much bigger than the other, the effective parallel impedance is the lower impedance. That's simply because most of the current will flow through that and very little will flow through the larger impedance. So we have this simplification that we have this effective circuit of the transistor, of course we have the RL prime, the load, and we have simply this one single capacitor C in the picture here. Of course if C were shorted out, that is if the frequency were high enough that you could treat C also as zero impedance you would effectively get the sim very simplified model of the mid-band amplifier. So, how do we calculate the gain of this circuit? That actually is pretty straightforward. All you have to do is find out the output voltage, which in this case, the voltage across this is simply the current beta IB with a minus sign because the current of course flows this way, whereas you want the current to flow this way through the load in order that the voltage here be higher. So, the voltage here is given by minus beta IB times RL prime. So, that's pretty straightforward. Vs, the source voltage, takes a bit more work. Of course, Vs, the source voltage is equal to the voltage drop across this resistance, which is beta plus 1 RE, the resistance, into IB, Ohm's law, nothing else. But to that, you have to add the drop across the capacitor. Now, the impedance of the capacitor, of course, is 1 by J omega CE. But what we have to bear in mind that the, is that the current flowing through the co collector, through the emitter, which is the current through CE, is actually the sum of IB and beta IB is beta plus 1 IB. So as a result, the overall effect is like this, beta plus 1 times RE plus 1 by G omega CE. So if you just divide the two, you are going to get the gain, that's straightforward minus beta RL prime divided by beta plus 1 small re times, well, if you take small re common out from this, you get 1 plus 1 by j omega C E R E. So that's AVS. Notice that at high enough frequencies, omega, when omega is very large, this term goes to 0 and you get the mid-band frequency, minus beta RL prime beta b, by beta plus 1 re, which as we have seen several times, is the mid-band frequency for this amplifier or at least the approximate mid-band frequency under the assumption that R1 parallel R2, etc. Uh, 
are, negl are negligible. That is, they are too big and so on. So, the expression for the voltage gain AVS essentially turns out to be the mid band AVS, AVS mid band divided by this factor. So, once again, it's pretty easy to see that the if you want to determine the half power frequency, all you need to do is figure out the frequency at which these two terms become equal in magnitude. That is omega C R E equals 1. So, the frequency F, which is 1 by 2 pi times omega, uh, omega, sorry, which is omega by 2 pi. It is 1 by 2 pi times omega, but is less unambiguous if we say omega by 2 pi. Turns out to be 1 by 2 pi C E R E. Small r. Now, let us check whether it is really correct that at this particular frequency range, you can ignore capital R e in parallel with cap C. Notice that this half power frequency is occurring when the, the, when, when the impedance due to C e, 1 by j omega C e, is actually equal. to the resistance R e, right? Which is why this factor essentially becomes equal to 1. So, the frequency is the one in which the impedance due to the capacitor matches that of small R e. Now, how does capital R, the emitter resistance, compare with small R? Small R is, of course, the forward bias resistance of the emitter base junction. That definitely is way tinier than the actual resistance capital R that you connect to the circuit. As we have been saying over and over again, small R has typically a value of the order of a few tens of ohms, whereas capital R in any decent circuit would be of the order of a kilo ohm or so. So, capital R e would be roughly 100 or at least 50 times. So, the frequency that we are looking at is the frequency at which the impedance of capital C of C matches that of small r e. And at that frequency, this impedance, the impedance of capital C of C e is still way, way smaller than capital R e. So, the approximation that we had introduced at the beginning that you can replace the RDCE parallel combination by just CE is a perfectly good approximation. And let me also point out that if you compare this expression for the half power frequency due to CE with the half power frequency due to CB1, notice that here you have, apart from the 1 by 2 pi, which is there in both expressions, you have 1 over CB1 beta plus 1 RE and here you have CE RE. So, that means that if you use CE and CB1 of comparable sizes, even then this half power frequency will be beta plus 1 times, roughly 100 times more than the half power frequency due to CB1. That is basically because in the other expression you have an extra beta plus 1 in the denominator here. So, if CB1 and CE are of the same size, then the half power frequency due to CE will be way, way more than the half power frequency due to CB1. In fact, even if CE were larger, making the denominator smaller, unless it is a lot larger than CB1, you will still see the half power frequency due to CE will come out to be more. And that essentially means that for most common emitter amplifier circuits, for most usual values, it is CE which really dominates the business. The, when you start lowering the frequency, the impedance due to CE is what causes the gain to come down first and then by the time CE act manages to bring the gain down by factor of root 2, the impedance of CB1 on this side and CB2 on the other are still very, very small. I will leave you to figure out what the half power frequency would be 
if you were to consider only C B two and with the other two replaced by shorts, and using the three, you should be able to estimate ultimately for a given circuit whether the half power frequency due to one of these three is much much higher than the those of the rest, and then that would be roughly the high power half power frequency of the actual circuit. Now, in most situations, because of this extra factor of beta plus one in the current to C. It is usually C E which dominates the lower cutoff frequency. That is, as you lower the frequency from the midband side, C E causes the gain to fall by a factor of two at the largest frequency, and that is why it is usually C E's half power frequency which is the half power frequency at the lower frequency range for a C E amplifier. Of course, this depends on the precise values used. Based on this, what we can say is that if we were to plot the gain versus the frequency, and typically we plot the log of the gain versus the log of the frequency, if for nothing else, then for the fact that the working frequency of a C amplifier can range over a rather big interval, and to fit all of this in and be able to see things clearly, a logarithmic scale is preferred. So if you plot it like this, you will find that the over a large frequency range, the gain is more or less flat. This, of course, is mid band, and at low frequencies, the effect of the blocking and the bypass capacitors kick in, and you have a decline down to very low gains. And here you see that the frequency is such that the gain has been cut down by a factor of root two. This, of course, is our half power frequency, which or the lower half power frequency. This happens at the low frequency end, and this typically, as I explained, happens more due, often due to C E than due to the other capacitors. Although, depending on the values of the capacitors, other capacitors might also get into the fray. At high frequency side, on the other hand, uh, once again, the gain is going to drop off, and you have what is called the upper. 3 dB frequency or upper half power frequency. Now, why does the gain fall off at high frequencies? For that, you have to understand that the capacitor, the transistor, actually comes with a lot of capacitances, which are stray capacitances. As I explained in a previous video, these are basically capacitances which form because of the fact. That a p-n junction has a depletion region, which is effectively like an insulated layer with two conducting regions surrounding it. That's of course how you make a capacitor. Of course, because typically the area of the transistor junctions are very small, and because you did not take special precautions or special or try specially to enhance the capacitance by using, say, a dielectric medium in between or something, you would typically end up with very tiny capacitors. So these three capacitances, C B E, C C E, and C B C, out of which C C E is not really due to a junction, but because of the fact that the base, which lies between the collector and the emitter, is again a nearly insulating region between two conducting regions. Anyway, these three capacitors are typically much much tinier than the other capacitors that we connected in the circuit. Uh, maybe these are of the picofarad order or so. So you have to go to really high frequencies before the impedance of these capacitors become small enough, so that they begin to provide viable alternate paths for current to flow. Note that this is the actual base of the transistor, but this is where the magic happens, where the transistor action happens. So, if on the other hand C B C and C B E have sufficiently low impedances, that is the frequency sufficiently high, then the base current Once it enters, will get diverted through this and this, and not, or at least a lot less, will reach the actual base of transistor, or a lot less will actually cause an amplification. So this is what we have to bear in mind. Okay. So what we want to do now is analyze the effect of the transistor at very high frequencies. That is. The effect of these three capacitors at very high frequencies, 
And for this, remember all the other actual capacitors in the circuit can be treated as shorts. Uh, and just like before R1 parallel, R2, etc. can be ignored. And of course, here you have RL prime, not RL, the parallel combination of RL and RC. So, uh, frankly speaking, the effective model that we, we have used for the transistor so far does not really work very well at high frequencies. If you want a more accurate match to the behavior of the transistor at high frequencies, you would have to use a slightly more complicated model. But right now what we are trying to do is not get very precise answers, but understand why the gain falls with frequency. At least a qualitative order of magnitude understanding will do. So we are going to keep on using the approximate model for the, for the transistor that we had used before with one additional proviso with the, with the CBC and CB and CC capacitors thrown in. If you do that, this is what the circuit essentially looks like. If you forget about the purple capacitors here, this essentially is just the simplified H parameter model or the Ebersmol inspired AC model for the transistor, a beta plus one RE resistor between the base and the emitter and a beta IB source between the collector and the emitter. The only new thing that has happened is that now you have three extra capacitors, the CBE, CBC and CC. The question that we are going to address is, how do these capacitors affect the gain? The calculation is going to be slightly more involved than the ones we have done so far. However, what we will always, we can always do is that we can rely on some approximations to make the final calculation come out sort of okay. So let's see. Notice that in this case I can immediately write down the IB in terms of the VS because or rather the current flowing in IB is essentially the sum of the currents flowing through these three paths. The current flowing through these two paths is simply the voltage Vs, which is the same as the voltage. I remember, uh, we are ignoring small rs or the source resistance, so there is no drop across the source resistance. So Vs into the all sum total of the impedances which point out of that node, that's 1 by beta plus 1 Re for this path. J omega CB and J omega CBC, which are just the admittances of these two paths, you have to add them together. And of course, you have to take away minus VO J omega CBC. This is essentially what we did when we used Norton's method or Norton's node method. So that gives us the current IB. Well, if you look at the other node, the current minus beta IB, which is the current flowing in into the node from this path, remember beta IB is flowing out, so it's actually minus beta IB flowing in. That has to be the voltage here times all the admittances. So, on the another pass, 1 by RL prime, and the admittances for these two capacitors are J omega CCE plus CBC. And of course, just like in orders whether you are minus Vs J omega CBC for this path. Now, our job, of course, is to find out the ratio between Vs and Vo, which is the voltage gain. And for that, all you have to do is actually multiply this by beta and add. That way the IV drops out and you can directly relate Vs to Vo. So it's just a matter of simple algebra and this is the relationship we get between Vo and Vs. Uh, well, this Vo into 1 by RL prime etc. is just this. So. This term is just this part. The J omega CBC essentially comes from sorry, this whole thing is here. You have an extra minus beta J omega CBC coming from beta IB, which you add to this to get a zero. So you have this extra piece. On the other hand, for v, Vs, you get 1 by beta plus 1 small re. 
times beta of course multiplying this with the beta plus j omega beta c b e plus c b c minus j omega c b c whatever is here. Now let's try to approximate or make some approximations to simplify the calculation before we actually go on to try to infer things from this. Notice that on this side things are pretty straightforward. Uh, this term because of the factor of beta is way bigger than this and this both of both CCE and CBC are very small capacitances but they are roughly of the same order. They are not the same but they are of the same order of magnitude and beta times that is of course much bigger. So, you can just forget about these approximately. So, approximately you can forget about these terms just keep this one. On the other hand if you look at this you might say okay there is an extra beta here so although you may want to approximately ignore this maybe you would have to consider this on the account but notice that here this term is coming with a 1 by rl prime which is reasonably small whereas here the term is 1 by small re which is rather big so at the frequency range at which this will become sort of comparable to 1 by rl prime at the same frequency range, this term, which will also be of the same order, will be much, much smaller compared to this term, which is F almost 1 by Re. Beta by beta plus 1 is a number which is very close to 1. So, as a, as a good approximation, you could actually drop this term, not because this is really very small, because there is an extra factor of beta enhancing it. But by noting the fact that the frequency at which this impedance becomes comparable to this frequency, this impedance, at that frequency, this impedance which has, or rather this admittance, becomes comparable to this admittance, at that frequency this admittance will be way smaller than this admittance. So, this 1 by Re will still dominate substantially over this one. So, once you make those approximations, you simply end up with AVS which is minus beta RL prime. So, that is just this RL prime going upstairs by beta plus 1 RE. Of course, because if you multiply both sides by RL prime to get here, this will become 1 minus beta J omega CBE at the side of VO. To get AVS, you have to divide VO by base and move this to the other side. So, you have 1 minus J omega beta CBE times RL prime to the power minus 1 or just as always this is the mid band gain and you can easily see that this has to be the mid band gain even if I had not calculated it before simply because at mid bands this omega C B E will become negligibly small. Remember omega may be quite large at mid band but C B E is so tiny that omega C B E is much much smaller or rather this factor omega C B E R L prime times beta is much smaller than 1. So, that is a mid band frequency and mid band this becomes a gain. So, actually the gain compared to the mid band gain is given by this expression. AVS is the mid band gain divided by this factor 1 minus j omega beta C P E R L prime. So, what half power frequency do you get? You get a half power frequency which is given by 1 by 2 pi beta C P E R L prime. So, once again to get an estimate, let us say if all the capacitors, all the stray capacitors are of the order of picofarads and RL prime is of the order of kilo ohms, this will still be of the order of 10 to the minus 9, right? 10 to the minus 12 into 1000. So, that is 10 to the minus 9. But you have a beta, so this makes it 10 to the 7. So, you have 10 to the 7 hertz by 2 pi somewhere around 1.6 megahertz or so. So, in a typical transistor amplifier circuit, the upper cutoff frequency will be of the order of a few megahertz. Of course, things might change if you change the values of RL prime and so on and this gives you a rough ballpark figure. So, as we have seen, the typical frequency at which lower cutoff will occur will be a few hundred hertz and typically will be due to CE. Of course, the value precisely will depend on the relative size and as well as the absolute size of C E, C B1, and C B2. I did not mention or I did not show you how to calculate the effect of C B2, but that will be a homework. 
essentially using the same methods that we did before. And the upper cutoff frequency that we just saw would be a megahertz or a few megahertz. Of course, uh, again, this depends strongly on the circuit parameter values as well as the value for the stray capacitors. So, these are not really very stable values, but they should give us a reasonable idea about the frequency range over which a CE amplifier would work fine. So, as we have seen, all the way from a few, um, say, kilohertz to around a megahertz, you will have a nice half mid band frequency. That means the gain will al be almost stable, at least frequency independent, over this rather large range. And let me stress once again the presence of this large range is simply because of the huge mismatch which in the size between the actual capacitors that you connect and the capacitors, the stray ones, which come in, which are unavoidable, but which come in simply because you couldn't design the transistor to get rid of them. So, this essentially concludes our discussion about the way a transistor amplifier circuit behaves. We have found its various circuit parameters, its voltage gain, its input impedance, its output impedance. We have now also understood why its gain falls off at low frequencies and high frequencies and we have also found a way of estimating at least the cutoff frequencies due to uh, at the lower end of the frequency range or as well as at the higher range or the, or the higher end of the frequency range.